Is it about my cube? Poor GameCube. You deserved so much better. Nintendo's fifth home console, the GameCube went head-to-head -head with industry titan Sony and their PlayStation 2, and newcomer, and also industry titan in their own right, Microsoft with the Xbox. Things didn't go too well for the GameCube, being handily outsold by its competitors, and given the shock departure of Sega earlier in 2001 for similar reasons, fans were rightly a bit worried. Hindsight being what it is, we now know Nintendo were absolutely fine, bouncing back with the Wii and holding their own quite handily against Microsoft and Sony with the Switch, but the GameCube was special. Yes, it had a handle so you could take it everywhere with you, and yes, it had several useful storage compartments to keep your biscuits in, but the games were really special too. And it's the games we'll be looking at today, the US launch lineup to be specific, all 12 of them. I'll be reviewing them kind of as we go, and I'll also be providing the Metacritic score so you can help judge just how good or bad these games were. Are you ready? Then let's do this. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played a baseball game before. Take that, idiot! Strike. But I've never watched baseball, so I'm going to give this everything I've got. Welcome to today's game of baseball, ladies and gentlemen, and away onto the pitch the players go, my goodness the speed. I decided to play as the Montreal Expos, because their logo is a bit like the number 69. Sort of. Left fielder, BJ Serhoff. I didn't edit that in, by the way. The game genuinely laughed at the name BJ. Got a level with you guys. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. I went to look at the controls, but all it let me do was choose whether it was me or the AI who actually played, which is quite unhelpful. Hang on, where are you going? In the end, while I was very good at pitching and made sure everyone on the opposing team had a go, I couldn't even swing my bat, which could be considered a handicap in a game about swinging your bat. 66% on Metacritic. We Sports did not prepare me for this. Growing up with Batman the Animated Series, I was very excited to play a game set in that universe, and although Batman Vengeance is actually based on the new Batman adventures, the art style and voice cast are practically the same. So, how is it? Fine? Actually, I sort of like it. Not in a it's good and underrated way, but in a my goodness this game is ambitious way. Yes, it's weird seeing the 2D art style in 3D, yes, Batman runs like he's had an accident, and yes, the presentation can be a bit stilted. Bum! But on the whole, there's a lot of nice ideas here. Batman can stealth around, bat cuffing enemies, there's a rudimentary glide mechanic, batarangs and grappling are possible if you can wrestle with the strange first person controls, and hell, when the combat goes 1v1 it feels quite cinematic, in a way. The Joker's design's a bit flippin' haunting, though. Ambitious but flawed, the game received a mixed reception from critics and fans alike, earning 70% on Metacritic. Loosely based on The Simpsons Road Rage, Crazy Taxi was the- I'm joking, please don't hurt me- Crazy Taxi was the pioneer of arcade passenger delivery, essentially tasking you with ferrying folks around town as fast as possible and completing as many jobs as you can before the timer runs out. The game was an arcade hit for Sega before being ported to the Dreamcast. Sadly, the Dreamcast didn't, uh, go too well, so it made it onto other platforms too. Choosing from four playable characters, including Cena- <laughs> The game's at its best when you're flying downhill with the iconic soundtrack blaring, replaced here for legal reasons by a song called Smoked Kilbasa Polka. The game's fairly notorious for including a number of licensed brands, with passengers asking to be dropped at the KFC or Pizza Hut, an ugly advertising habit gaming has thankfully dropped in the years since. While many outlets praised the game for how much fun it was, Crazy Taxi received a surprisingly disappointing Metacritic average of 69%. Nice. 
While many extreme sports aimed to ape the success of the radical skater boy Birdman's undefeatable pro skater series, few succeeded. Enter Dave Mirror Freestyle BMX 2, which while not on the same level of quality as the Birdman's games, definitely had it where it counted. One quick point though, why do all of the playable characters' photos look as though they're taken from active arrest warrants? Anyway, the game features big maps with plenty of objectives to complete before a timer runs down, certainly familiar to fans of a certain skateboarding series, and the controls are mostly the same too. It also lets me play as Slim Jim. I never knew anything about Slim Jims besides Randy Savage's contractual love for so it was nice to finally be in the loop. On the whole, it's a great game, and a wonderful alternative for BMX fans looking for decent video game representation. The grinding noise hurt my teeth, and steering with precision can be tricky but it earned a solid 78% on Metacritic nonetheless. Movie tie-in time! Well, kind of, and I'm reading directly from Wikipedia now. Picking up quite a while after the defeat of Clayton, Jane and Professor Archimedes Q. Porter now speak gorilla language fluently, and Jane is married to Tarzan. Brilliant. So it's an action-adventure game where you trot, I think that's what trotting is anyway, around saving baby apes and wrestling guns out of the hands of humans. It is occasionally and unintentionally funny. Epman was Epman. Everybody look lovely, we've got company! But given it's far faster to jump around than the awkward slow slash fast trot, frequent deaths will have you restarting from scratch, which is what happened to me. 61% according to Metacritic, and never again, quite frankly. Chucking you into a spooky mansion without so much as a solitary joke or moment of levity, Luigi's Mansion starts off very strong. And to be fair to them, Nintendo does horror surprisingly well, especially when they take familiar kid-friendly characters and throw them into the deep end. It honestly feels like a creepypasta fan game to start with, not because it's low quality, but because it feels very un-Nintendo. Of course, that changes when you encounter Professor E. Gad and witness the cutesy ghost designs, but top marks for winning the definitely would have made me scared to play it as a child award. A prestigious group. I love the Game Boy horror in the corner keeping track of your stats, how Luigi hums nervously along to the music. And, well, just the music in Gad's lair, really. Oh, yeah, this slaps Richard! With a rough goal of destroying the mansion and saving Mario, brave boy Luigi uses the torch and poltergust vacuum cleaner in tandem to stun and suck the ghosts in that order. I really liked it, and so did fans, but it underperformed with critics, earning 78%. Thankfully, vocal players forced the big N to turn it into a series, with Luigi's Mansion 3 released on Switch in 2019. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played an American football game before. It's like you're playing Dynasty Warriors with shoulder pads. But I've never watched American football, so I'm going to give this everything I've got. No matter what happens, the choice is on you. This is John Madden 2002. No matter what happens, the choice is on you. This is John Madden 2002. Cool. Oh, looks like they're playing in COVID times. Oh, no, my mistake, there's the crowd. My boys, the San Francisco 69ers are back in action, and this may have been one of my worst sports time performances yet. While the really fun sports charts made a welcome return, I must have been selecting the wrong ones because I just could not throw that ball to a free sportsman. The crowd mocked me. Playing in defence was way less fun, and I'm sorry to say I gave up on the 69ers before any sports points were scored. I must be a big sports idiot, however, because Madden NFL 2002 scored an impressive 89% on Metacritic, with G4 TV giving it a perfect 100% score and calling it an incredibly deep and solid game. I've never felt so out of touch. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played a hockey game before. The crowd was truly going bonkers for honkers. That's what we hockey fans call hockey. But I've never watched hockey, so I'm going to give this everything I've got. It's got that limpy limp biscuit intro music that we all loved in 2001, replaced here for legal reasons by a song called Smoked Kielbasa Polka.
Selecting my MySpace top three to represent me in Sports War, I scored almost immediately and have suffered night terrors ever since. I then struggled to hold on to my lead, but I had a great time beating the stuffing out of the other team. Not only did helmets go flying and a man went through the glass and over the barrier, but it turned into a 1v1 fist fight towards the end of the game. I fear. My second goal was just about the sloppiest thing you could possibly imagine, but I consider that a victory. Neither the final score nor the record books will, but I do. And isn't that the most important thing? 79% according to Metacritic. The LucasArts logo is hundreds of stormtroopers dancing with yellow signs, confirmed. I knew that fan theory was onto something. Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader was a GameCube exclusive, and it was a launch game, and it was really, really good. Essentially tasking you with playing through various memorable moments and some others from the original trilogy, Rogue Squadron 2 really does a phenomenal job of making you feel immersed in Big George's house of star wizards and aliens. The opening mission attacking the Death Star is hectic, with a collage of sound and explosions all around you, and when it came time for that iconic trench run, original dialogue from the films is piped in as the music swells. The force is strong with this one. I did manage to single-handedly put an end to the rebellion, though. Darth Vader would be proud. Nintendo World Report called it a visual and oral masterpiece, saying the game has all the bells and whistles you'd expect from a next generation game. Unsurprisingly, the game scored extremely well and earned an impressive 90% average on Metacritic. A Japanese video game where you roll monkeys down a hill in a giant ball, Super Monkey Ball represented the best of where the franchise could go and what it could achieve. After all, in a series of Japanese video games where you roll monkeys down a hill in a giant ball, what can truly be done to iterate? Well, a robust suite of party games for one, as well as a challenging selection of courses for your monkey in a ball to roll along, down, or off. I chose Mimi the monkey because with a name like that, how could I not? And excuse, excuse me, what was that? Outrageous. Before a licensing dispute saw them removed in a later version, you won't be able to avoid noticing that all of the curved yellow fruit adorn the doll logo, an ugly advertising habit gaming has thankfully dropped in the years since. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. It's a game that's accessible, yet requires patience and skill at the same time. You're not steering the ball after all, but rather manipulating the entire stage. Clever. Super Monkey Ball scored 87% on Metacritic, with Edge praising the game as absorbing. Whatever that means. Another launch lineup, another appearance from the radical cool skater boy Birdman. Yes, Tony's back, and with Dave Mirror and his most wanted lineup of BMX cronies breathing down his neck, Hawk needed to prove himself. What's that? 91. 91% 91% on Metacritic. Jesus, all right, Tony, calm down. From the iconic Motorhead intro, we can't play for legal reasons. To the robust, feature-packed, and highly detailed levels, THPS3 was a home run. It represented a new beginning for the series, and impressively adapted the heights achieved in the previous games to the new powerhouse home consoles. I naturally had to create my very own Skater Boy, and in an effort to stay true to Avril and See You Later Boy, I made him very short, very fast, and with incredible leaping ability so I could hopefully lose him. But then I remembered how bad I was at Tony Hawk games, and it all came crashing down. I didn't let the upsettingly de detailed leg-grabbing animations deter me, however, and one day I will become the Skater Boy. But not now. Pro Skater 3 was a highlight for the series, and with the success of 2020's remake of the first two, hopefully there's more skating on the horizon. A sequel to 1996's Wave Racer 64, Wave Race Blue Storm is a jet ski racer game, and a lovely one at that. First off, I'm a big fan of this main menu, with its water plop noises. Oh, delightful. The character select screen is full of your average racing stereotypes. Look, they even have the fit American, complete with dumbbell avatar, and the fat American with a double cheeseburger as an avatar. Got to play as that guy. I don't know 
what I expected. It's a pretty game, with water physics actively making the goal of passing the boys, or buoys if you want to get North American about this, a real challenge. This shifting water positioning changes up which shortcuts are available too, making each race feel dynamic in an impressive way. AI can be brutal, and you can actively skip boys at tactical times for cheeky shortcuts as you get to miss a number of them before being disqualified, but it's colourful and fun, and was a great showcase of the power of Nintendo's new machine. 80% on Metacritic. And that 80% brings the total average score of the GameCube's launch lineup to 78.2%. And so there we have it, all of the GameCube's launch lineup reviewed, sort of. Which ones were your favourites? Do you even have a favourite? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. Why not also like this video and subscribe to the channel? And you can even follow me on Twitter to keep up to date with all of these playing every launch games videos. There's going to be more. I promise there will be more. Thank you so much for watching. Look after yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.